I am absolutely delighted, thrilled, and honored to introduce to you all Dr. Jennifer Danette Dale. Um, she is Dene from the Navajo Nation. She was the first Navajo to earn a doctorate in history, and she's a professor of American Studies at the University of New Mexico, and she was my professor in Chicago at the Newberry Institute a few years ago. She is the author of a groundbreaking book, uh, Reclaiming Dene History, The Legacies of Navajo Chief Manueleto and Juanita. She was reared on the Navajo Nation in New Mexico and Arizona, and she is the great-great-granddaughter of, uh, of the well-known Navajo chief Manuelito and his nearly unknown wife, Juanita. Uh, stimulated in part by seeing photographs of her ancestors, she began to explore her family history as a way of examining broader issues in Navajo historiography. She has also published two books for young adults, numerous essays, articles, and book chapters. Dr. Danette Dale is director of University of New Mexico's Institute for American Indian Research and serves on the Navajo Nation's Human Rights Commission. She has received the rainbow, oh, I should have asked you how to pronounce this, Natsidlet, uh, true, thank you, True Colors Award for her support and advocacy on behalf of the Navajo LGBTQI, as well as the 2013 University of New Mexico Sarah Brown Bell Award for her service to her community. And in 2017, she received the University of New Mexico Presidential Award of Distinction. Please welcome me in, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeanette Dale. very pleased to be here at the University of, of Winnipeg and to be um, part of this um, Distinguished Speakers um, series. Yesterday I was coming through customs and the custom official asked me what my business was here and I told him I was delivering a lecture here at the university and he asked me what topic and I said critical indigenous studies and he said well that seems like a pretty pertinent topic right about now. So. <laughs> So I am Diné from the Great Navajo Nation. My clans are Tloge, Do Ashi Himbashishim, Kitlachitni Desha Che, Toa Hedlini Desha Nala, Without Aya Stanan Shle. I am, we are a matrilineal people, and when I offer you my clans, um, I am remembering our grandmothers through the re reciting of our clan kinship, and so I also extend kinship to my relatives to the north. Hey, um, I met Karen Froman and Darren um, Korchi um, at the Newberry Library because the University of Winnipeg is a member of the Newberry Consortium of American Indian Studies. And I'm very delighted to um, continue my relationships with Karen and Darren, and I'm pleased that Karen is an, um, an indigenous uh, historian. I am also by training a historian. So this afternoon, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share my own journey on the path of education, and particularly my movement to embrace a Diné and indigenous feminisms that includes uh, queer studies. And I'd like to begin, okay, there's the front cover of my talk. I'd like to begin with um, paying uh, homage to my parents, Frank and Rose Nez. I grew up on the Navajo Nation, uh, and it is a place probably, my experience is probably common to many indigenous people in that um, public school education did not offer any kind of indigenous or Diné history or anything on culture, uh, uh, and that our home places, community-based home and family, it is in these spaces that we were, are persistent in who we are as Diné and as indigenous people. And so I always thank my, my parents. My father was a reader, he valued um, education, and so I was surrounded by books um, as I was growing up. My, um, it wasn't until I came to um, higher education at the University of New Mexico in 1976 that I begin my own quest, my own journey to find out and to learn about the Diné history and culture outside of my family and my um, community. And so it was when I was a graduate student, actually, that I began to learn about Diné history through my grandmothers, through my genealogy of my grandmothers. And I come to find in, um, that my, grand, my mom had always spoken about my grandmother. And when you say grandmother, um, there's a suggestion of, of how many uh, generations that you're talking about. Okay, so grandmother can mean any grandmother across any uh, generation. And so he, um, 
one day when my mom was talking about my grandmother, I realized that she was talking about uh, my great 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 grandmother who was married to um, in Navajo, his name is Husky El Hajine. And uh, my, my grandfather is remembered for his advocacy of American education for Navajo students when he signed, was one of the signatories for the um, a treaty between the Americans and Navajos, the Treaty of 1868. Um, what is less remembered about my grandfather is that in 1851, he and his men, um, Navajo warriors, attempted to burn down the fort, Fort Defiance. <laughs> Okay, um, in an effort to rid uh, ourselves of American occupation of Navajo land. So in doing this work, in, in recovering the history of our people on our terms and uh, working with my elders, um, the descendants of Husky El Hajine and Astant Loke, I began to do work in oral history. And as I moved through that, um, I begin to think about the status of women, particularly because we are a matrilineal people where women were once the backbone of the economy through um, uh, weaving, and that women held leadership, positions of leadership, women owned or, or dictated land use, women owned um, children, had ownership of uh, care of children and of, of the home. And so, I begin to think about the beginnings of life under heteropatriarchy, uh, under um, what Audra Simpson calls the gifts, the gift of democracy. Okay, um, part of um, I also wanted to just share here that our our histories are very similar to Indigenous peoples' histories in um, Canada. My uh, one of the provisions of the Treaty of 1868 is that our, our leaders had agreed to send our children to American um, schools and to boarding schools. And one of the first schools built was the Carlisle Indian School, where my um, great great grandfathers, um, as boys, were sent, and one of whom died there within a few months of coming to, of getting to Carlisle. And th so his name he died at Carlisle. Um, his name means. Um, which means leader who stands back, and then um, his younger brother, which means leader who stands. And so this, um, this young man who was Manuelito's uh, um, son and uh, one of his other wives, not my grandmother, um, he came home sick um, after his brother died. And the oral stories that I found of um, Manuelito talking to his people when he buried his son um, at home after he arrived um, back to our homeland, he told his people that, um, he says, when I sent my sons to Carlisle to school, it was not with the intention that they would die there or that they would be hurt. I agreed to American education because I was thinking about inna, which means Navajo people's word for life. I was thinking about life and how we will go on into the future, was what he told his people. And he said, we should hold on um, with everything we have for the future of our people. And so um, I remember those stories that I had recovered um, of what um, American education has done. And so in my work then, uh, I, I spend quite a bit of time um, with critique and with theory, with the theories uh, that indigenous scholars have produced, um, interdisciplinary, but also thinking about what my own people have to offer me in terms of our ceremonies, our prayers, and our stories. And so um, that then led me to think critically about um, the place of women and leadership. And so the first, pic the first picture, one of the earlier pictures I showed you of my grandmother with her, with her husband um, offers up assumptions of how we have become not very different from other, any other American family um, in the United States. My grandmother appears to sit in relationship to her husband in a binary relationship of hierarchy of dominance and sub um, uh, subordinate position, okay? So those are kind of the assumptions that these photographs bring up. Um, and these were not meant for um, indigenous people or Navajo people. 
uh, when they were taken. So here's my grandmother in 1902. The first picture I showed you, I think it was um, 1868. Okay? And this one is a photograph of my grandmother in 1902. The, the woman, the two women are her daughters. The one with her hand on her, um, on her daughter is my great-great-grandmother. And the young woman with a string around, uh, of beads around her neck is my great-grandmother. Okay, and so um, you will notice that there is one um, boy in the picture and he's dressed in Western style. This is part of that um, when Navajo people were sending their children to boarding school and because uh, Manuelito had agreed to send our children to boarding school, he sent his children um, as a model to other Navajo people. Um, you don't see the men in this picture. Uh, the photographer and the lecturer, James Horton James, George Horton James, um, who included this picture in his book, um, Indian Blankets and Their Makers, remarks upon this photograph and says, try as he um, might, he could not get the husbands of, of my um, great-great-grandmothers to come into the picture. Okay? And that's because we had a taboo about um, son-in-laws being in the same space with their mother-in-laws, you know, and I think that's probably a, probably a really good practice. <laughs> um, and so um, thinking about then about women's leadership um, led to the kind of work that I do as a researcher and a scholar, and I always tell my students in my audience that the places I find my research questions are placed, are based in, in the conversations um, that I have with my, um, my people, with, with the Navajo women, um, and we un often consider these spaces to be domestic and intimate spaces, okay? And so because often women's matters are considered to be domestic and private intimate, we then have the kind of violence against indigenous women and against Navajo women of uh, which we are trying to attend to today. Okay, so, um, so those spaces are where I find my research questions and the kinds of cares that my people talk about in these spaces. And so one of those places, and, and here's a picture from um, uh, Milton Snow, when we begin that transformation and that movement um, into American education, which is an imposition of heteropatriarchy, okay, the erasure of women's authority and former um, status, um, and also the disappearance and erasure of our uh, gender diverse relatives. Okay, so um, I included that photograph just to make a comment about those transformations. This is a Milton Snow um, photograph. I'm presently working on a book of the photographer Milton Snow who came to Navajo and worked w on the, in the um, Navajo um, civil, what was it called, Navajo Civil Service, Navajo Service, which was in the 1930s part of the New Deal efforts in, in the aftermath or during the, um, the, the Great Depression, um, where Navajos were subjected to all kinds of technologies of Western, um, of, of Western thought, you know, um, and these efforts were to turn us into American citizens. And so this photograph then, uh, it was um, intended to document this transformation and to reassure, reassure officials in Washington, D.C., as well as our own people, that um, uh, Indian agents and the federal government had only our um, welfare um, in their in, our, in their best interests. And so the caption on this photograph is Navajo people looking to Uncle Sam um, to prosper in the future or something like, something like that, okay? Uh, so we have been, and because I, I do this critique, I think a lot about how our, our people, our communities and our nations have been vastly transformed by the imposition of settler, um, settler colonial frameworks, you know, that extend throughout all of our lives, uh, the, um, um, every institution, um, even before we we're born, that we are subjected to. Okay, so that's the kind of critique, and I do that within an indigenous and Diné feminist lens, and add, um, and also under that umbrella, I also include indigenous queer critiques. Okay. Um, and this imposition of patriarchy, of heteropatriarchy, um, begins in 1863 when Navajo people are subjected um, and um, when the um, American army under Kit Carson burns and scorches our homeland, our people are forced to surrender um, at the forts, uh, Fort Defiance and Fort um, Wingate. 
And some of the um, soldiers' reports indicate that our people were literally starved into submission. And when our people came into the, into the um, forts, some of our people literally had only a piece of clothing covering their private parts. Okay. Um, my grandfather, my great-great-great-grandfather was known as, um, and he's in the military records and is um, considerable presence in, a, in Navajo and American histories because he was the figure of Navajo resistance first to American uh, Mexican occupation of, um, of the southwest of Navajo homelands and then American occupation. And I came across a military, uh, a soldier, uh, an officer, military officer's report that in which he says, only until we have killed or, or forced um, the surrender of Manuelito will we consider the Navajo people wholly defeated. Okay, so that's how much weight they thought my grandfather had <laughs> um, in, in terms of Navajo resistance. And so by the 1920s and 30s then, you have this, uh, especially under John Collier's um, administration and the Indian Reorganization Act, which Navajos um, did not vote to accept. Nevertheless, we came under an IRA government. And so you see this imposition of heteropatriarchy, of male dominance in our government um, that we still are speaking to and challenging today, particularly as um, Navajo women and as LGBTQ um, citizens of the Navajo Nation. Okay. Uh, so then um, some of the questions that I pay attention to because I'm listening to conversations, and this is a Milton Snow photograph, is the question of women's leadership and tradition. And I'm indebted to the work of uh, Joanne Barker and Audra Simpson, for example, and Mishana Goldman, who raised the question of these categories of tradition that once, um, as indigenous scholars, we go to our communities and someone invokes tradition, we automatically stop and agree that we will continue to practice or think this way because of tradition. Okay, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> And as a historian, I trace some of the ways in which women, for in this um, in this example, of how women's leadership is challenged and how tradition is invoked um, to legitimize the disenfran oops <laughs> the disenfranchise. Okay, let's see from the beginning. Uh, okay, I got it. Yeah. So the disenfranchisement of women. Um, and this includes um, sexism, misogyny, and homophobia. Okay. So in um, a couple of recent um, elections, of, um, uh, Navajo elections for the, um, president of the, Nav the presidency of the Navajo Nation, we, and we inevitably have to deal with the question of of whether or not women can hold the highest leadership position in the Navajo Nation. And me being a historian, I can object and say that actually these modern governments are not traditional either. <laughs> Among some of my um, participation in these um, debates and discussions. So, um, so then I think about the ways in which um, tradition, the language of tradition, the practice of tradition, um, comes through and is filtered through these nationalist narratives, including indigenous national narratives, okay? So how did we come to the point that we accept as normal and naturalized um, heterosexual nuclear family units, okay? Um, where the binary of the masculine and the feminine continue to be the foundation of our indigenous nations. And so I go back and I look in the archives. I love archives. And I also respond to non-Indians non who write about Navajo people. We are one of the most written about and published um, people <laughs> in the United States. And so, there's an, and so I respond in my work to um, non-Indians who write about us as well. And so there's this incident that happened on Navajo, and it's always, it's called the Uprising at Beautiful Mountain of 1913. And so there's this journalist by the name of Don, Bill, Don, uh, Bill Donovan who writes about that and includes a picture of Fort Wingate. And he, his, um, his conclusion to what happened at Beautiful Mountain was that this was a point where Navajo people were coming from tradition into modernity, tradition versus modernity. Okay, that's an imposed 
um, category onto indigenous people and how we should think about our histories and who we are as if there's some kind of divide between our worlds, okay? It's the same thing of stuck between two worlds, confused between two worlds, you know? That's an imposed um, category, an imposed way of thinking about indigenous people's historical experiences. So then I'm in the archives in um, Washington, D.C., working on a case with, for the Navajo Nation and I come across this, um, this file and it says the, beautiful, the uprising at Beautiful Mountain and I immediately um, copy the entire file. <laughs> and as I'm reading through the file, um, this is not about tradition versus modernity, okay? This is about um, Indian agents at the, um, following the directives of the federal government to turn us into heterosexual family unit, units as the norm. Okay. Traditionally, Navajo people practice polygamy. Okay. Um, it was common for men to have several wives, and often the women were related. They, were, they might have been sisters, or they might have been clan sisters, or they might have been an older woman who had a, a, um, an adult-aged daughter, and the man would marry both, men, both women. Okay. Um, it was men who had of wealth and some, some status, um, who, who had multiple marriages. And today, and then also another practice was that it was, it was people had heard of um, uh, older women being given in marriage to younger men and that was one way to tame the wild young men. And then when I tell my, especially my young people, we should go back to that tradition, <laughs> you know? And then the young men are like, ew. <laughs> So, you know, you're raising thoughts. <laughs> you're raising thoughts and thinking about what our people were like, what were former practices, and why we had those former practices, okay? You also think about, you know, what was it like to be in, in a multiple marriage? You know, you could just call your co-wife and say, can you take him for a few months? I'm just really sick of him right now, you know? And that, you know, realistically, a man couldn't support <laughs> several wives. So the economy was different. The dependence was on kin relationships and kin structures through women's clans. Okay? Um, traditionally, um, it was really nice if a marriage worked out, but if it didn't, which was often common, and especially in times when um, people died at younger ages and men were in places where um, they you know, died young and suddenly, um, you had kin relationships in place, okay? So if a, fa if a marriage didn't work out, that was okay, because women were, and children were protected by their clan relationships, the maternal relationships. Um, it was the place of um, the mother's brothers who, um, who took care of um, the children, okay? And instructed um, the boy children in, in, um, ma in manhood, for example, okay? So when you think about that, and uh, the limitations of nuclear family units and these binaries, then you think about how kinship was actually ways to create community and to, com um, to create support for families, okay, and especially for young women. Okay? Um, and so those are kind of the ways that I rethink or think about traditional ways of thinking about how kinship and eh, which is our word for kinship, worked, okay? So this story of the last uprising Oh my God, I'm already almost done. Okay, so I got, I'll say two more things. So this last uprising, which I, I wrote an essay in Joanne Barker's um, collection called Critical, Critically Sovereign, and it's indigenous feminist work. Um, I find that this is not about tradition versus modernity. It's about the Indian agents' efforts through whatever means possible, including violence, to stamp out Navajo practices of polygamy. Okay, and it lasted over three, three or four months. Okay, so that's what I found out when I read that file. So um, what I want to end with then is my movement and my journey of moving away from the binaries of gender, of masculine, masculine, um, masculine and feminine, but to move into diversity, the, the diversity of gender that our societies once, I believe, practiced and had respect for. 
as a historian, I found evidence through anthropological writings in the archives that we acknowledged at least one, a third gender, um, which we called um, Nudley. Okay, and that's up for public discussion of what actually that means in creation narratives and how the LGBT community is taking up that term of a third gender. Okay, so then um, tradition and gender then and the, co the kinds of uh, conversations and discussions that come up about the inclusion of gender diverse, our gender diverse relatives can be intense. Uh, and I've been a part of those conversations as an ally of our LGBTQ relatives. In fact, it was my article, Recarving Navajo National Boundaries, in which I mentioned the Diné Marriage Act of 2005, which is, um, is uh, often presented as one that is about gender discrimination against our LGBTQ relatives because marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman, is supposed to be sacred, does not recognize different forms of relationships. Okay? Um, and so I've been a part of that conversation and that article um, brought me to the attention of our Navajo Native LGBTQ communities and they consider me to be um, a, an ally, which I am. So. Um, I, I do want to talk about this photograph, but I can talk about it later. <laughs> this is a part of my, um, the, one of the articles that I just co-authored, and it's in El Placio if you're interested. But people often misread this photograph um, and say that this is evidence of same-sex marriage between Navajo people, and that's just, that's not the truth about this photograph, okay? This is a photograph of Navajo captives being taken to um, Fort Sumner, the prison camp, um, in 1866, okay? And so I, I wrote that, I um, co-authored an article to correct that because we can't impose meanings of the, pre we have to be careful about the kinds of meanings that we impose onto historic photographs. So because of my advocacy then for our Native and Navajo LGBTQ community, I then was um, given my own um, drag show, <laughs> okay? And I was so honored to be there with, our, with my friends, our allies, and the, and the drag queens in, in Gallup, New Mexico, okay? So um, what does, I think about a lot about what education means, especially when we are in these spaces that are settler um, spaces that they claim, and yet our students and our faculty hold spaces, hold place in these spaces for our people and for our concerns. We refuse to be folded into the multicultural narrative of the United States. We claim a distinctness based upon land and territories and distinct cultures and distinct indigenous epistemologies. And so I just want to end about what research means to me and what decolonization means, and I take up Leanne Simpson's words, the most critical test of our work is how it validates, clarifies challenges, inspires, and confounds our own communities. I mean my work for my own people, for my own indigenous people. Okay? That's who I think about when I write and when I research and I educate. And then again, Leanne Simpson's work has been influential. Uh, resurgence does not literally mean returning to the past, but rather recreating the cultural and political flourishment of the past to support the well-being of our contemporary citizens. We reclaim the fluidity of our traditions, not the rigidity of colonialism. And I think that's just especially apt when we begin to do gender studies uh, and gender and sexuality studies, okay? We have the capacity to name the traditions that um, are, well worked so that we are all flourish within our respective indigenous nations and communities. And I remember also the teachings of our ancestors as a chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission. I have the privilege of listening to our Diné um, traditional people and our Hatathis, our medicine people, that they carry the wisdom and the knowledge um, so that we will continue to be um, the people that our ancestors um, are proud of. So the way our ancestors used to think about the things they believed in was perhaps their greatest attribute. They died for their most central beliefs and gave their lives for their most critical possessions. Because of this, we are here today. And I always remember the messages of our, of our ancestors and the prayers. And one last one, 
I have lost my way many times in this world only to return to those round shimmering hills and see myself recreated more beautiful than I could ever believe. And I believe that when we return to our relationships to the land, when we return our relationships of, of, of connecting to all humans and non-humans, we will remember always who we are. Come on down, Jennifer. No. <laughs> How much is this ball of water? Put your, no. <laughs> yeah, actually, what's, oh, the host of The Price is Right, uh, Bob Barker, he was Lakota, right? Anyway, so it makes sense to, all right, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves while I get set up here. Actually, you know, since it was one of your uh, last slides, um, the Leanne Simpson quote, the most critical test of our work is how it validates, clarifies, challenges, inspires, and confounds our own communities. I thought we could start there because that uh, really stood out for me. There's so much, it's, it's, it's quite a mix, it's quite a balance because on the one hand, you could argue, you know, validating your community, inspiring your community. Some would, I think, superficially go, well, that sounds pretty biased. That sounds pretty subjective. You're an academic. You're supposed to be neutral, right? You're not supposed to be a cheerleader. Then on the other hand, you've got clarify, you've got challenge, and you've got confound. <laughs> so, you know, and I had to look up confound just to make sure I understood the word, because I know what it sort of means, but, and various uh, words listed there. Merriam-Webster says it means baffle, mm -hmm. frustrate, discomfort, refute, and perhaps sloppily, <laughs> superficially, I thought of a trickster. Mm -hmm. And the coyote tradition is really the, 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 the figure of a coyote. So are you, uh, would that make you a coyote? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know much about coyotes. Neither do I. <laughs> um, but I know a lot about um, indigenous women's talk and I know a lot about Diné women's talk and I think that I come from a place where um, women are a very strong presence mm -hmm. and so that is um, my legacy and I'm really honored to be a part of that uh, legacy. What about this notion that you know we should stand at a, at a distance from our communities in order to best serve them as opposed to validating them, inspiring them, you know way to go team kind of thing. I try to do way to go team, but then I'm always the one raising my hand and saying, but what about this, but what about this, you know, and keep asking questions and keep asking questions. Um, I'm the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, and in my, in my first full appointment of four years, um, I raised the question of violence against Navajo women and, and gender. And so I've been part of the discussion and the public awareness of violence against Navajo women and, and our LGBTQ relatives, you know. So um, I think the confounding and the opening up space um, so where we can talk about these in, in an honest way. Um, there's, I hope there's some, been some um, things that I've done that are optimistic and that make people um, do those things to make sure that we all belong equally in our nations. Have you, just to continue with the team metaphor, have you ever been accused of not being a team player? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Including your work on the commission? Like, why are you airing our dirty laundry, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, feminists, Diné feminists and indigenous feminists are just, are just loud. <laughs> um, but we don't go away, you know. Right. And so um, I'm inspired by uh, indigenous feminist uh, thought and practice. I do want to, if we have time, talk more about your work with the, with the commission, but I'd like yeah. to, to, to go to an essay that I wrote in preparation for our talk. Okay. Uh, it's called Securing Navajo National Boundaries, War, Patriotism, Tradition, and the Diné Marriage Act of 2005. And you once wrote of how we as Native peoples have internalized American ideology so that many of us exhibit amnesia about our history under colonization. And sometimes I find it useful uh, to engage in thought experiments, and, and specifically 
using the different lenses of seeing things as problems and seeing things as symptoms. And I'm wondering to, the ex to what extent is internalization a symptom and in, in what ways is it its own problem? In other words, if by some miracle Canada or the US turned around tomorrow and said, indigenous self-determination, we're down with it. We're actually gonna implement on DRIP. Would these issues around identification with the settler colonial state take care of themselves by virtue of that restored decision-making capacity? Or is that identification the first thing we need to tackle in order to make self-determination possible? It's kind of a chicken and egg question. I'm kind of not being fair here, but <laughs> there, there it is. I mean, in some ways, that's the dilemma, right? What, what do you tackle first? Tackle both? Uh, I'll stop well, talking. <laughs> well, um, I wrote that article after 9-11 um, when the U.S. perceived itself as being attacked from the outside. And I watched all the, all the rushing around on the ground and the hand-wringing of, oh, why do they hate us so much? And, <laughs> and uh, reports of the Dixie Chicks um, CDs being oh, yeah. crushed by tractors and <laughs> Navajo people wearing these t-shirts that say these colors don't run, you know, and then in the aftermath of that, then seeing uh, the Diné Marriage Act um, being proposed, which is the same-sex marriage ban, and I was like, what's happening here? What's going on? And so I'm listening to these conversations, and I'm trying to make sense, and um, I find that, you know, when you when you're securing your, Navajo, your, your boundaries and, and our indigenous nations are imposed upon by democratic principles you know, of uh, supposed equality and, and quest for freedom, that when we inherit those principles, democratic principles, we then are um, condemned to practice the same kinds of inequalities. Um, amongst ourselves, and so we practice then gender inequality, we practice um, uh, hatred of women, even though we don't call it that, you know? So then my, my critique then led me to, to write that, because I was like, what's going on? And that article is the result of what I think is going on. Um, in terms of uh, the question, or, or I think the pointing to that you're doing, Rick, about our domestic dependent relationship to the United States, and if the U.S. ever um, embraced UN principles, you know, I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I'm actually very <laughs> pessimistic about the ability of uh, international human rights um, mm. to have any kind of workings on the U.S., especially at this time. I, I might sound pessimistic, but I'm actually very optimistic because Indigenous people in our nations, um, we've survived incredible trauma, incredible um, the war against us, and we persist, and we persist because of our community efforts, because our everyday practices of kinship that we extend to each other, those things that, those practices and those thoughts that are often illegible to settlers and their settler governments, is what keeps us vibrant and radiant. And so I draw my attention to what our communities do on an everyday basis. And I put my hopes on my own people's continuation of our ceremonies and our prayers and our practices to extend um, kinship, our responsibilities to ethics um, and morality amongst ourselves is what keeps us alive today. Interestingly, though, you go on in the essay to talk about, you know, you're talking about people who are identifying with the United States, these colors don't run right after 9-11 because the United States is perceived to be at war, but the United States <laughs> is at war with those people who are identifying with it. So it, it, I, I imagine, you know, on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, right? to try and hold that tension in your mind, to, trying to grapple with that contradiction can, can overwhelm some people. So sometimes you just, who wants to be, you want to be on a winning team. I don't know why I keep coming back to this team metaphor, but anyway, <laughs> in, in that same paper, because um, you use the word survival, and so in that same paper, you write about uh, the indigenous absorption and advocacy of settler colonial values as a kind of survival strategy akin to what some people call Stockholm Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to quote you here. Just as victims of trauma, 
such as those held hostage, suffer physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or cult indoctrination, good way to describe uh, <laughs> membership in the United States or Canada, so have Native peoples exhibited an emotional bonding with their conquerors. Mm -hmm. You then cite Dakota historian Waziyatawin, who mm -hmm. wrote, while this might be a way to overcome powerlessness and maintain hope in an overwhelming situation, it nonetheless denies the violence of the perpetrator. Or, perhaps some rationalize the abuser's violence as a way to maintain an emotional and psychological bond with the colonizer in the face of an ongoing colonization. To which you add, quote, Navajo's uncritical acceptance of American values and the ways in which they have aligned contemporary Navajo beliefs and practices with tradition can be seen in the blurring of American and Navajo values. Can you speak more to just, you know, I mean, <laughs> like, again, like we, 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 it would be a horrible, th I don't know, there are those who resist the idea of victimhood, there are those who resist the idea of, of, of being on the losing end, and so they, they, they want to be, oh, where am I going with this, I'm not sure, <laughs> well, I guess, can you speak more to, well, to, to those think, issues that you identify? I think American schools and, and um, being put in American public education, starting with the boarding schools with my, my great, great grandfathers who did not live because of that experience. Um, the doctrinization has been great. The trauma has been great. And I think that I tried to think my way through this indoctrinization of American education. And that doesn't happen. That thinking through and that critical consciousness um, doesn't come through um, because of, of my being immersed in American education. That critical consciousness comes from my own people. Mm -hmm. It comes from um, my father, who was willing to speak critically. You know, on the one hand, he would be um, he would be critical of of um, the United States and its treatment of indigenous people, and then the next day he would be reading biographies of American presidents. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but I think I think it's my I I think of my scholarship and the work that I do um, as a way to get my people to think critically about our places and how we've become so um, part of that multicultural narrative, you know, to speak about um, militarism and the imperialism of the United States and how we do ethnic soldiering on their behalf um, is to open up a big giant can of worms and so for so many people to just refuse to, to hear what I'm trying to say um, to try to silence me, you know that that article with with the references, the critique of um, U.S. participation in U.S. Um, our people's um, patriotism to the U.S. and our participation in militarism and its imperialism um, is it's one of very few pieces that even critiques that. And so we have a long ways to go. And then the connection of indigenous men's sense of manhood to the US military and to patriotism, you know, that work needs to be done. We need to go through and start working on these connections and disconnect them. You know, I guess one way to look at it too for me is there are so many incentives to assimilate. There's so many incentives to be part of the larger society that so for example we have this pipeline debate, right? I mean that's a literal manifestation of it where it's like, belatedly, corporations and the government are saying, hey, maybe we do want to welcome you to enjoy some of the spoils of resource extraction. Again, very late in the game. And so, I mean, that's a tangible version, but there are what we might call softer versions too, just feeling like you're part of Canada, you're Canadian, you're, you, you hold the flag up and recite the, you know, God save the queen and all that stuff. And so I'm wondering, at some level, do you blame people for do you know what I mean? Because I think that's the tricky balance. Because on the one hand, you want to identify what's going on. On the other hand, you don't want to say, so clearly, you're not as Indian as you should be. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? Do you, do you ever come up against that? That people, they push back because they're saying, you're saying I'm not an Indian? Are you saying I'm not Navajo? <laughs> to hell with you, right? Do you, do you ever get that pushback when you're confounding people? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not... I guess I'm, I'm not really interested in, in that conversation or that kind of discourse. 
I'm really interested in the kind of work that um, our people do on the ground and in mm -hmm. communities. Um, I live in a place, I'm the chair of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, yep. as I said, and we deal with um, complaints from our citizens of racism and discrimination in border towns and in larger cities like Albuquerque and Phoenix. Okay, we deal with... For people we, who don't know what a border town is... Those are towns that exist just outside of the boundary of the Navajo Nation. And these towns are places where we come into um, because our, our nation does not have an adequate infrastructure. Okay? We have to go into these settler towns for even our most basic necessities. They depend on us for our money. You're an economy so, to them. Yeah, we are an economy to them. And yet, they just blatant dis displays of racism and anti-Indianism is what, what we deal with. Like they, so, they, they crap on the hand that feeds it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm interested in the ways in which um, we push back um, in our resistance, you know. Um, and it's a, you know, we're, we've been in a war um, for 500 years, and we see the, the ante upped right now, but it's not different from the 19th century. It's not different from when my people were um, put into the... Um, concentration camps in 1863, 1863 okay? Uh, our struggle is long, but our persistence is long too. <laughs> and so I always value um, our persistence and our determination um, to be indigenous people and to be Diné. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I, um, I concentrate on and what I look at when I do my work. You've talked about, or hinted at this already, but uh, I'm just, if you could talk more about how the work of the commission dovetails or overlaps or amplifies your academic work. Um, the commission was uh, established in, um, I think it was 20, 2016, I can't remember, but uh, one of our tribal council delegates um, worked to establish the Human Rights Commission as the only human rights commission of any native nation within the United States. We're the only one who has and, one. In Canada too, as far as I know. Yeah, and it was established um, when a white police officer in a border town in Farmington killed a Navajo man, okay? Um, and so trying to work through all the kinds of violences, you know, and bring some measure of justice to, uh, for Navajo people is just, it just never ends. Um, it was established in 2006, excuse me, the Human Rights Commission. In 2016, um, two Navajo men were brutally mutilated and tortured and killed by three Hispanic um, young men in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay, so Indian killing, Indian hating is a sport and it's a tradition in settler societies. It hasn't ended, okay? And so that's the kind of, of uh, things that we attend to with the hopes of um, justice for our people. We will never get justice in settler courts or je settler just, uh, in settler justice systems, you know. But we continue to, to raise awareness. We continue to contribute to the um, disruptions and the eruptions, you know, because they, they keep having to remake their authority in the face of constant uh, resistance. That means that they, fu they never fully have ever um, authority and control. To what extent is the Commission's work taken up with, with issues that originate outside the, the, the nation's boundaries and how much of it might be more internally focused? Our directive as the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission comes from our tribal council, especially particularly the Nabikia Committee, which is made up of our council delegates. And our directive is to deal with racism and discrimination that happens to our citizens outside of the Navajo Nation. Okay, so we don't, we're not, we're not supposed to deal with in-house kind of, um, okay. of struggles. <laughs> so <laughs> only so much confounding you can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, glancing at the website, and I, and I encourage people to go to the website because it's it's just fascinating. I we have the Canadian Human Rights. Commission, yes. which actually in 2011, its mandate, its jurisdiction was extended to reserves, but that's mm -hmm. a whole other discussion mm -hmm. that we don't have time for, but th it's organized according to 13 grounds of discrimination, whereas mm. your uh, website is organized by sector, education, business, law enforcement, social service, and then something called at, at large. large. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, uh, I, 
I wish we knew more. I wish more people heard about this because mm -hmm. I just think it's 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 a fascinating and important extension of, of in, uh, indigenous sovereignty, Navajo sovereignty in this case. So, yeah. um, a couple of things. One is the influence of the missing and murdered indigenous women's um, work that's been done here in Canada has influenced um, the task force that are happening. Uh, um, in New Mexico and with the Navajo Nation uh, in terms of the missing and murdered indigenous women in, in New Mexico and then um, with Navajo, with um, Amber, uh, the Honorable Amber Crotty, who's a council delegate, the missing and murdered um, Diné relatives, that in these towns and cities, a lot of Diné people are murdered and they go missing, you know, and we, ha we, we face the same kinds of dilemmas in terms of uh, a complete disregard uh, of us as human beings who deserve some justice, um, a lack of law enforcement that pays attention, uh, the ways that uh, families are treated when they report a murdered um, relative or a missing relative. You know, So uh, we're seeing that influence right now, and one of the things that I've been interested in, and I actually wrote a, uh, two papers, <laughs> two essays that are for, one is I just wrote, and one is, um, forthcoming in a, in a collection on ur Indians and urban spaces or something like that is the title of it. But in 2016, a Navajo woman, L'Oreal Sinajini, was um, murdered by a white police officer in Winslow, Arizona, you know, and we don't have the kinds of inquiries or inquests that take place in Canada. Um, and of course, there was two investigations done by law enforcement, and of course, you know, they redeemed themselves um, and say, you know, there was nothing wrong done. Um, but with the Human Rights Commission, we did our own investigation, brought in um, Shireen Razak, um, who used to be, I think she was at one of the universities here in Canada, but she's now at UCLA. Um, Melanie Yazi, who's an indigenous Diné feminist, and my col they're both my colleagues, and then um, David Correa, who, who does um, work on police violence. You know, but we simply don't have those kinds of inquests and investigations going on in the U.S. in, in regards to um, police violence and indigenous people. Just a quick question before we take questions from the floor. How, how is the work of the commission funded? The Navajo Nation. Hmm. Oh, the other thing um, that we've been working on, one more thing, <laughs> is um, Navajo voting rights. And so we've been working with Navajo voting rights and then in southern Utah, um, in in settler elections. Just yeah. To, yeah, settler elections. Yes, settler elections. Um, Navajo people are always continuously um, di disenfranchised from voting in, in settler elections. And in southern Utah, um, where there's you know, Navajo people, um, we had to bring two lawsuits against San Juan County, and we were... Um, we were successful. And now there's a you know? majority on the, on the three person. Well, there's person. always a majority, but not in the, in, in the, in the leadership. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now we have two Navajo commissioners on the San Juan County Commissioner Commission, and they're daily. They're harassed every yeah. single time. Yeah. Um, they hold a meeting there. The white commissioner um, refuses to hold the meetings on, in Navajo places. Yeah, non-Navajo freaked out. They're, yeah. <laughs> all of yeah. a sudden, yeah. majority rule is no good anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, I had a U.S. Uh, former uh, attorney uh, say to me one time that one of his plaintiffs, there was a lawsuit with the Navajo Nation and um, the, the lawyer of, 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 the, of the person bringing the lawsuit said, or, or the, the, the person he was representing who was non-Navajo outside of the jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation said, you know, Navajo Nation doesn't have jurisdiction outside of the boundaries of the Navajo Nation. And he said he told him, told that lawyer, well, tell that to the Navajo Nation. <laughs> okay. So through the Human Rights Commission, we've been able to exert some means of authority wow. over cases or issues that are about um, Navajo um, grievances, you know, regarding uh -huh. racism and discrimination. Well, I'd love to talk about whether that could be replicable here or whether it should, but that's a, that'll be another day. Let's try and get some, we have this uh, handy little box here that we can throw at you and speak into the, the black part. 
Uh, <clears throat> quite a number of my friends in the uh, uh, U.S. are uh, or consider themselves to be Nadle. Do you see sort of uh, spaces for them in the governance of the Navajo Nation? There are there actually are. Um, Navajo gay men who are in some of the leadership positions in the government. Um, and so I think there are also, and we haven't had this discussion yet or, or this determination yet, but I think that what Scott Morgison, when he talks about homo nationalism and he says that our aspirations as, um, as, as queer, which some people don't like to use that term queer, but LGBTQ, our aspirations are not to, are not about fitting into the status quo. You know, our aspirations are about um, everyone should belong and everyone should have re um, equal resources, access to resources of a nation, and in our case, the Navajo Nation. Okay, so, but um, the, we haven't had that discussion yet, and I think um, that's one that's probably coming, you know, because I, I do agree that it's not about um, a personal moving into the status quo, which is a heteropatriarchy. Um, and the, and the, we, the, the word nadle is a Navajo word that goes back to our creation stories, and it's a mention of a third gender. And that third gender um, is a person who brought the women and the men back together after they had a terrible argument and separated. And so the Dudley, the third gendered person, is someone um, who's very much needed in families and in communities because they are the person who is the negotiator, they are the person who is the medi mediator, they are the person who holds vast ceremonial knowledge. You know? And people, one of the things when I'm doing this work that I think about is that you often hear about a loss of a family member, like if you didn't grow up with your father or your mother, or you feel loss and you talk about that loss. And yet, it's been third gender, fourth gender, fifth gender um, presence in our communities and our families has been so erased from our consciousness that we don't even feel that loss, you know? That's how much indoctrinization we have, exper we have experienced as indigenous people and as Diné people. We have a question from the back. <laughs> uh, I just wondered uh, how much the um, uh, Navajo uh, people um, have or have not uh, joined in into the civil rights movement. I think the civil rights movement is a lot different than indigenous people's quest for liberation and for freedom. They're, they're completely different movements and determinations. Um, civil rights movement was very, of the 70s were very much about inclusion in, in the status quo of access, equal access to education, to leadership positions. And indigenous people, I think, um, have different and distinct claims. You know, um, and so I think there's there's there are different visions. Um, our vision about freedom and our uh, vision to be indigenous people are very distinct and very different from um, civil rights. But since you are sitting in the Human Rights Commission, isn't that the uh, umbrella, uh, the civil rights uh, umbrella for? Civil rights and human rights are different, are different things. Um, civil rights is very specific to um, what you're talking about is, is the United States, but the human rights also is formed and fashioned by heteronormativity <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and a patriarchy, you know? Um, and at this point in, in time within the United States, with some of the work that we've done on the Navajo Nation to try to bring attention to the U.S.'s treatment of, of Navajo people and the Navajo Nation, um, we don't get very far, particularly with sacred sites. And so it's been, it's been long years of petitions and complaints before the international 
um, Human Rights Forum with very little to show for it. You know? So we've spent more of our time on um, human rights and civil rights um, within the, on the Navajo Nation and as it, as it relates to our relationships um, to border towns and to um, cities. Okay. How are we doing on time? Uh, we're out of time. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> um, so please join me in thanking Dr. Jennifer Denenden.